when you're not yourself and you're not comfortable and you're not being you and like following your gut and trusting yourself, like it's never going to be as good as if you're just like in the moment as yourself. Welcome to the Funny and Failure podcast, a podcast that celebrates failure and shines the light on the emotional side of comedy with yours truly, Michael Kahan. Today's guest is absolutely hilarious. She's loose, authentic, not afraid to be herself and says it how it is. This is a great chat with all around great vibes and with a lot of laughter. No topic is off limits here. So let's get into it and officially introduce Lisa to the podcast. Lisa Traeger is an actress, comedian, and podcast extraordinaire. Named one of Variety's top 10 comics to watch, Rolling Stone's 10 comics to watch, Comedy Central's comics to watch, can you tell Lisa's one to watch, and a comic where sex and politics intersect by the New York Times. Lisa can be seen in Netflix's brand new comedy series, Survival of the Thickest, based on Michelle Buteau's best-selling book, Survival of the Thickest will debut this coming Thursday, July the 13th, so go and check it out. In film, Lisa can next be seen appearing in Goodrich, alongside Michael Keaton, Mila Kunis, Andy McDowell, and Kevin Pollack. Additional recent film and television credits for Lisa include appearing in Judd Apatow's The King of Staten Island, Jordan Peele's horror mystery, Nope, the Emmy-nominated miniseries Horace and Pete, Appearances on Late Night with Seth Meyers, Lights Out with David Spade, Pause with Sam J, At Midnight, Adam Devine's House Party, Chelsea Lately, with dozens of panellists and game show appearances. In stand-up, 2015 was a breakout year for Lisa, hosting her own half-hour comedy special for Comedy Central. This special was also released as an album entitled Glitter Cheese through Comedy Central Records. Lisa then went on to appear on The Degenerates for Netflix, a collection of half-hour specials alongside Mrs. Pat, Jim Norton, Nikki Glaser, to name a few. She's currently a regular at the Comedy Cellar in New York and the Comedy Store in LA and has performed internationally to audiences in Melbourne, Sydney, Athens, London, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Dublin, Amsterdam and throughout Canada, to name a few. Lisa also hosts the successful podcast, That's Messed Up, an SUV podcast, which averages over half a million monthly downloads. As comedians and amateur detectives, each week Lisa and her co-host Kara Clank break down episodes of Law & Order SVU while doing a deep dive into the true crimes that they're based on and interview on-screen talent ranging from the biggest stars to joggers who find the body. So as you can imagine, we dive deep and we cover a lot and we chat about roasting porn stars for brazers, her frenemy podcast, ending friendships for long-term happiness, integrity, stand-up, being her best and dedication to the audience, her longevity mindset, safety and creeps. Before we get into this chat, in case you aren't aware, the videos are now available on YouTube under Michael Kahan, that's Kahan with a K, unless you're listening to it already. I find it adds a new element and dynamic to these chats. I'll still be posting snippets of these chats on Instagram under Funny and Failure, so check them out if you want to stay in the loop for upcoming episodes or you want to ask a guest a question. I'd also love it if you would share the podcast or share your takeaways from the chat. It really motivates me, helps the podcast grow, and ensures I can lock in amazing guests like this one. And just as a final reminder... The podcast comes out every Monday at 5 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time with the video to follow the following day. Anyway, sit back, relax, and enjoy today's epic episode. Oh, okay. This could be a hilarious place to start. I saw that you did a porn star roast for brazers. Can you please tell me about that experience and how you got involved? Yes. Um, So I... I was so excited and I got this offer from Brazzers and then all my representatives and agents were like, don't do it. It's a terrible deal. And I was like, I don't care. It's my fucking dream. <laughs> so I got yeah. to do it. And the audience was mostly porn stars, which was amazing because 
we got to like meet all these amazing people. Three porn stars were on the dais too. Bob the drag queen was telling jokes. Seth Tolov, like it was their comic and drag queens. Um, the porn stars were Bonnie Rotten, Lisa Ann, and oh, uh, who was the girl? There was one more. That's bad that I don't remember. But anyways, they were so funny and it was the best. And I got all this advice for people that did the AVN like porn awards and they were like porn stars are the worst audiences they're wild they're this or that and we all killed and i think it's because we were fans and we're so happy that it was positive uh, like i think everyone else was just probably like your dad hates you you drug addict whores you know and so i think because of our reverence towards all the people that were there i mean it was a bella danger adriana chechik it was it was it was really fancy, and I got merch, and it was amazing. What is? I'm afraid to ask. What merch did they give you? Honestly, Pornhub um, and Browsers are all owned by the same company, but oh. their their uh, merch is high quality. So my sweatpants retail for over two hundred fifty dollars. Um, oh. They were like a collab with a designer. Like it's really high quality merch you must you might hear you seem shocked but i'm very shocked very good quality clothing I w- it wasn't like when you go to like a fancy event how they give you like some average chocolates or like a water bottle that's kind of like break down you know in those little like gift bag they actually had designer clothes i'm not yes. I'm surprised but not surprised that's pretty cool because i were i did something for brazzers another time at the porn awards i kind of bombed that one i didn't do good at the booth i was too nervous i think but in the contract I put in, I want close. Oh, that's so cool. So I have so many more questions on this. How did they discover you or did you know someone? How do you actually get involved in something like that? So the company that owns all these porn sites is based in Montreal. Oh. And I do the Just for Laughs Comedy Festival um, every year. And I, I do a lot of jokes about porn <laughs> and I, I'm like, I do dirty jokes. And so they were just at my show and then I got offers to do stuff. That is so interesting what your career, cause this, you know, you think the career can go one way, then you do all of these different things and you're very happy that you've done this. It's also <laughs> great sport by a lot of the, the porn stars as well, that they want to get roasted. Cause that can be a bit, that can be a lot. A lot of people can't handle the roast. Well, it's funny because Braz, there were a lot of rules. It was like we couldn't talk about, a, like, you know, no pedophilia, no drugs. Like, there were a lot of rules um, that kept it more positive, but I think it was funnier. Like, sometimes you don't have to, I mean, for a roast, I get you want to be mean, but it ended up just being so positive. It's, it's kind of, it's, it sounds like a wedding, how everyone <laughs> embraces each other afterwards and hugs. <laughs> and it's just like, we're best friends. I would, I would never have thought that would happen. And why were your agents and managers and your teams like pleading with you to say no? This happens. I think it was like a bad deal. I think like the money might've not been bad or they own it or own the material. Like who knows something oh, in the contract a, that I wouldn't pay attention to. It, was it a content thing or a money thing? Um, money and maybe ownership or like, I bet there was something that annoyed them. I don't really know. I didn't care. I just said, I want to do it. Fair enough. It's, and I then saw your own, um, which I didn't even know she had a podcast. I actually don't watch porn, but some of the names spring to mind. But Bragging. I <laughs> no, the reason is, is very long story short. I haven't spoken about this. It's just that I noticed like from a male perspective that relationships would change after stop watching it. And it's almost, you know, for a lot of guys, I'm not sure about girls, it has this a chemical element where you can kind of feel addicted. Not that I was addicted by any means whatsoever. And I've noticed great changes in my mental well being, but that's not a go at porn. That's just for me. And it's I haven't watched in years. But I can appreciate doing a roast. I think that's really cool. So yeah. in terms of the oh yeah, there were there are a few things here. So you then went on to, I think you went on to Lisa Ann, one of the people you're roasting's podcast. Was that through that experience? It was years later. I did Lisa Ann's podcast just this past year. Oh. And I, that's how we met. And she's incredible. She does a lot of sports casting and podcasts. She is like a businesswoman mm. extraordinaire. Um, and so, but it was the best, like the, her apartment has the most beautiful view. 
And I was, I was like, oh my God, your view. She goes, yeah, I didn't sell my pussy for nothing. And I loved that. <laughs> she got a good sense of humor. And well, the queen of porn is from Australia, Angela White taking over the whole, whole world. She comes up on people that I know for sure don't like a lot of girls that for sure don't watch, or at least they don't say, and everyone knows who she is. It is crazy. It's all over everyone's for you page. I'm blown away how she has reached such a high level of recognition. I'm also, yeah. I'm also wondering, you know, that's a career highlight and I'm wondering, and we'll, we'll talk about your upbringing in a bit, but what your parents thought when you, when, did you tell them about that? And was it a bigger deal than we? <laughs> okay, no, they don't care. They don't, they're also foreign. Like they don't really, they're, they don't speak English, you know, really. They, I just do my business and they don't really bring stuff up, but my nephew. <laughs> so the Instagram post uh, promoting the Brazzers roast is like, it, there's graphics and it's my face. And then there's just like a bunch of like dildo dicks around, like a, like a semicircle uh-huh. of like art, but they're not that obvious. But I was like taught my, the caption said, this is my dream or something like that. And so my <laughs> nephew showed me the photo and went, this is your dream this and uh so he kind of got me but my parents don't really i don't know they don't get involved if i don't want them to be involved i tell them what i want or That's not fair enough um or whatever stalking they do when you won jewish person of the week in one of the chicago um <laughs> <laughs> was that also a career highlight for them were they aware of that one yeah, I think they liked that one. <laughs> I don't know. They like print media. That's that's yeah. their favorite. So if I'm on a poster, it doesn't have to be media, just a print. Like, so if I'm in a big poster, if I'm in a newspaper, magazine, that's they like that. It's really interesting. I've spoken about this a bit on the podcast. You know, I've done some like maybe like higher profile like podcast or done some other stuff. Parents don't really care. I've got a great relationship with them. But then when they see me in like a newsprint article, which will not have that many eyeballs, like, oh my God, my son is doing so well. He was in the newspaper and like this little blog or something. It's funny how the parents like have no perspective and, and they shouldn't, but they see the world so completely differently to us. And you've been on huge podcasts, you've been on TV, you've done, you've done it all, but it's the print that probably stuck with them potentially. The yeah, way. for sure. Print or like, I got to, I met Demi Moore. It wasn't even a job, but like, it, but being around people that they know, that means something, you know, uh, like 90s people. But yeah, print media really gets them going. My favorite is I opened um, Segura a few years ago, did, oh, I don't know, with pandemic, how long ago, but recently, I would say. Um, he just did like a small show at Caroline's because he does arenas now, but he was just doing new material at Caroline's. And I was opening for him and Hannibal was in town. So Hannibal jumped on and both Hannibal and Segura taught me a lot when I was a young comic. And so I wanted to take a photo with the two of them. So I, I just, I took a photo with me in the middle and I sent it to my parents and my dad cut both of them out, blew up my face and got that printed and put that in a frame. Oh, that's so funny. Oh, did you, have you ever bumped into those two guys and shown them what your, your dad did? I'm sure they'd appreciate it. I just told them, but um, I was like, no, the whole point is I was with those people. And he's like, I don't know who they are. Like, I don't care. <laughs> and uh, so. You have, a, you have a really interesting story and I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about it. I know that you left um, Ukraine or it was the former Soviet Union for religious asylum. And it's crazy yeah. coming from that background now that you're doing comedy and you've been doing it for a few years and you've been doing a few other things as well. Did you ever th- think that when you'd move, that you'd be doing stand-up comedy? Well, I was really young. So it's not really, you know, I was three years old. So I don't have intense memories. But I think it's cool. I think it's wild. Like what would have been possible? What It wouldn't have been possible if we stayed. Yeah. And we left before the collapse. Like who knows? And then now it's like so bad. Um. So yeah, I don't think I'd be able to do anything of the sort, anything close. I think I would have been got, getting a lo- in a lot of trouble. Or maybe I would have persevered and been like a famous person over there. Who knows? It's really- maybe I could have taken the whole place by storm. But it's also like living my mom's dreams because she loves movies and like loves everything. And so oh. 
it um i get sentimental at times like it's cool i get to do stuff it's really interesting because when people you know my parents immigrated from south africa to australia and just hearing every story in the works that when people immigrate they typically want their ch- their child to you know do something that's a more stable career whereas mm-hmm. like doing the arts so i do screenwriting podcasts you know you're doing acting podcast writing stand-up comedy it's generally seen as an absolute no-no because it's not stable and it's something that the, perhaps the parents above us didn't understand so i'm wondering was there a bit of pushback when you said that you wanted to do this no, not at all. I think, um, I guess they're not traditional in that sort of immigrant foreign way, but I think for them, like me being able to do whatever I wanted was huge. Like, even if like they hate my tattoos, but I, n- I never felt like I couldn't do what I wanted or who I really was. Like I, w- I always felt comfortable to do that. My and name. I think my parents had me later in life as well. And I don't think it's like the key to everything. Like I'm sure there's shittier older people, but my parents were 42 and 50 when they had me. And so I think you have a lot of life like experience. And so they knew if they tried to like stop me or control me or make me do something, I would resent them and then like not do it anyways, but hate them as well. And so they, they just had more life experience to be like, you can't, control a human (laughs) they're gonna do what they want to do and we need to support them and i think they were happy that i get to do what i want to do and live this like free incredible life i think i know for a fact it makes them worried that i can't save money that i spend insane that like yeah i think deep down they're probably talking shit about me (laughs) or like (laughs) i'm sure they're like oh i'm i I know for a fact they would love for me to have a spouse and a home and like more stability in that way. Yeah. But not, and then really early on in my comedy life, my mom said every year there's progress. So how could we be mad? Oh, so that was cool. So and it, it. Yeah. And then it didn't hurt that I was like a maniac before I found comedy. So it was actually like calmed me down. I was just like so partying fun. and going nuts. And then when I found comedy, like I was just doing comedy every night. So it, that's better. It, great. Is it that you found your thing and it kind of like calmed you down? Cause I know that. Um, yeah, it's you exactly dive, that. You, you can dive in deep as, uh, as much as you want, but I think it's really empowering. And I think that you were arrested and you dropped out of college and stuff was going on. And then you're doing stand up. Um, you found therapy. Oh, I graduated. Oh, okay. I was wrong. I don't know where I graduated. (laughs) No, but I I went to three different schools. So I did drop out of Iowa State, went to a different one, graduated from another one in sociology. But I I wasn't like an academic. And I don't think I would have graduated if it wasn't important to my parents. But they paid for it and they really wanted me to do it. What was the goal? What would you have done if you didn't find stand up? Do you think? I think I'd be like a receptionist at a salon. I don't know. I've really, I think I'm perfectly suited for this. Yes. Agreed. And, but maybe speak, I don't know. I went to, um, ice tea ceremony. He got a star on the walk of fame yeah. and the woman that was in charge of introducing all the speakers and the ceremony sucked and said everyone's names wrong. <laughs> so maybe I would work in a place where I would be like, doing I, some sort of talking or team building exercises. I don't know. Did you ever do stand up? I know this is more an improv experience. I don't know if you've done improv, but like stand up for not necessarily corporates, but getting like team building exercises through stand up. Or is that more an improv thing? That's more improv, but I played sports my whole life. I know all about team building. I did theater in high school. That's where the acting's come on. So I'm just, <laughs> I'm just wondering, and you can dive as deep as you want. You mentioned that comedy kind of helped mellow you or make your words less of a maniac. Um, I saw that you, I think you were arrested, and it sounds like you've gone on this wonderful positive change of self awareness. And we'll we'll dive into some aspects. Do you remember? Yeah, I mean, you- all yeah, all my no, because I was blacked out. But like, all my arrests happened before I was 21. Yeah. So it was just like drinking way too much and then do it, you know, breaking rules and like doing bad things and being wild in public. And so I don't, I don't, 
obviously like getting to the point where it's arrests, it makes it seem like it was way worse. But I feel like that's what you kind of, you party when you're young. And I just took it maybe a little too far in terms of the amount of liquor. It, it's interesting because I've listened to so many podcasts and read like 50 articles of yours and also seen your stand up. It does. It's oh my like, God. I know I'm your number one fan. It sounds like you've gone through this really positive journey and you've mentioned therapy in a few podcasts, which I'm a huge advocate for in that it's built more self-awareness. And I think you also did, I'm not sure if you're doing any more at the enemies podcast. And I thought that was such a great idea. It was so fun and good. I got canceled. It was canceled. So maybe I could bring it, but I, but maybe I can bring it back to life one day. Yeah. Can you tell me a bit about that? Cause that's such a cool idea. Yeah, I wanted a show where people I don't like or don't like me come on and then we could like talk about it um, without any like huge goals. There doesn't need to be a push for reconciliation or forgiveness or anything. I just think it, it's interesting like why um, certain people don't like each other or the history of that. Mm. Um, but that those people didn't really want to. <laughs> They were hard to schedule with, you know, like they don't want to do, <laughs> they had no reason to go out of their way. So I was just like hounding down people I hated and I didn't want to come on. I had a couple that I knew our attention whores, they came on and then a few people like we weren't friends and then became friends. So that was mm-hmm. great. Um, And then I had like duos that were feuding or friends and I talked to married people and counselors and friendship experts. So Whoa. it shifted the journey um, but it was still like super fun. And when you mean canceled, you don't mean canceled. Like you're taken off the air in terms of like, we're going to cancel this person in terms of just the network or whatever you're working with said no. Yeah. I guess canceled means something else now, which is so annoying and stupid. No, like, like deleted, like not renewed. <laughs> it is such a good idea, but I would imagine, as you said, it's so hard to schedule people and some people wouldn't want to be on air and there's just so many to me it's amazing it's also i would that's why i brought up the story before and also therapy because you would have to be self-aware enough and want to actually like learn from potentially any wrongdoing that you've done of course yeah i had one guest a comic named jade um and she like i yelled at her (laughs) in an elevator at a festival once and like you know i my there was just like an issue with one of my good friends and her and I just had a, an immature view of loyalty. So in my head, I was like, well, if my friend doesn't like you, then you're a dumb bitch. And so I held on to this thing for no reason. And then she had stuff. So yeah, but we were so past that. So it was like nice to talk about, but we were both acknowledged moments and why, like why she did the thing to my friend. Like we all just discuss stuff because you're going to do fucked up shit, but then you can hopefully look back and go, oh, I was just feeling this emotion at that time, or I wasn't able to settle with that or whatever it is, or some people you just don't like. I think it's just, uh, as I said, such a good idea because to look at, you know, our part as well, want to explore it, want to actually admit things that potentially weren't going right for us. I think it's like massive, like um, self-awareness as well, but also you're putting yourself out there and you're acknowledging maybe some biases that you had or the guests had. And I think it's just so cool that you could actually do that. You know, it's one thing to do it, you know, call up someone, but, you know, actually put it on air and, you know, you're very vulnerable doing it as well. Yeah. And the people that did listen, I think got a lot out of it. I got really nice messages from people and we had like experts and therapists and, you know, different sort. Uh, We had an etiquette expert. Um, Emily Post's like great, great granddaughter came on and Emily Post um, does like these etiquette books. Very famous. I don't know if it's just uh, mostly American, but um, so it was a variety of really fun stuff and all about interpersonal relationships and interactions. And yep, because I want to mention listening to it when you see two people like beefing over something, we would also see ourselves in the relationships because we all don't like someone yeah. for some reason. We all have these relationships, and just to be able to see that, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Is it still like? Can people still see it? I fucking hope so. That would be <laughs> wild if they took it off the internet fully. But um, I really hope it's still there. But maybe it costs money to have it on. Who knows? Enemies with Lisa Traeger. Let's see. No, you can listen. Oh, that's fun. Everyone check it out.
Would you ever just do it by yourself without the network? No, 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 no. (laughs) I don't, I don't want to edit. I don't want to pull up. I don't want to do technology. There's apps. I am stand up is very solitary and like you do stand up, but everything else I'm all about camaraderie, teamwork, partnership. Like I like working with people that are good at things I'm not good at. And then vice versa. Like I like group projects. That. It's very rare, especially in stand-up. I know you've got like a tribe of people that you really like in the stand-up world, but stand-up, you know, I always talk about stand-up versus improv, and I know you don't do improv, but stand-up to, to me, or especially people starting out, can be very much an individual sport where it's all about me and you don't have to deal with anyone. I think stand-up is, but I think everything else, I don't, like, I like to work with a partner on like projects and other stuff. Oh, interesting. So in terms of, we've had a lot of people talk about the stand-up aspect where because you're getting up alone, um, that can feel a bit isolating, but people have spoken about, you know, they might have like a duo to write, whether it's a screenplay or help with their jokes or just to give advice. But starting out, a lot of people have felt, and you know, this is a stereotype, so it's not applicable to everyone, but there was a lot of jealousy or people would be upset if someone's done well. And a lot of these other things that you don't necessarily see because people all want to rise to the top. So there could be all of these conflicts. Have you had experiences like that or you've always had your people? And Yeah, no, it's, it's like a gross, it's, I mean, it's human nature or whatever, but yeah, people are psychopaths and like wanting to be successful is, Yeah. I've dealt with it a lot. I've had friendships end because I did not want to be friends with people who are not happy for other people. I've had long lasting decade plus relationships end because of people not able to be happy and not even career stuff. Like this person was just like not able to be happy for others wow. and not, and not willing to work on it in any way. Um, Cause it was years and it's yeah, done so for me. Because of the podcast, I talked to a female friendship expert, Danielle Byer Jackson. I'm obsessed with her. She's so smart. And that's like some of the cores of friendship is being able to, like, if you have good news, you should be able to call your friend. Agreed. And if you can't do that, that's not your friend. Um, that's not, because fr- you're all, you're allowed to also be like, oh my God, I'm so happy. Or like, you know, like pregnancy stuff, if you're trying to get pregnant and someone is pregnant, like that, that can make you go nuts. Um, But if you're able to then be like, I am so happy for you, but this is really hard for me. I need a moment. That's fine too. You can communicate those types of things, but truly not good. And the other thing about friendships, like you should be able to be your full self around somebody. And yeah, I had a lot of friendships kind of end because of and what's wild is it's not like I have more than this person. <laughs> that's what's like the best. That's that's what you learn. Um, Cause I have such rich, successful, talented friends and they are all, they are looking at other people, comparing themselves, still mad that other people have things even though they are crushing it. So this person on paper has more jobs than me, has more money than me, owns proper and still like was unable to be kind i wouldn't call them with good news ever it's really interesting this is something that i've battled with as well and i have been on the other end so i'll give an example and it changed my um my mindset one of my friends had really good news and i came from an insecurity and i also want to applaud you for saying that you know we can't have the negative thoughts but rising above them saying, you know what, I'm still going through this, but I'm really proud of you. That's important because those negative thoughts are going to be there. We can work on it and and, th- and thrive with them, but still being able to be there for a friend is important. But I'll, I'll give this example because it's really changed my perspective. One of my friends had really good news and I thought I was being supportive. And he said, you know what, uh, you weren't that supportive. And he called me out of it. And I was like, oh my God, I had no idea. I'm so sorry. And I looked at it. I looked into it and saw that there was jealousy, which I never realized. And the friend brought it up and it made me realize, why would I have that emotion? And I dived quite deep into it. And now my philosophy is, and it's not to overcompensate, I genuinely believe this, that if my friend or any friend has good news, that is good news for me. Because if they're happy, it radiates happiness. And it's so, it's so important in our, in our friendships that if someone's doing well, to really cherish it, because I kind of view it as a flame. 
if someone's happy and they're doing well, it spreads in some way. I might not get the movie if my friend gets the movie, but I'm just so happy that he or she's got yeah. it. It's about being on the yacht. Like, who cares whose yacht it is? I just, like, I, I want everyone, like, you don't want all your friends to be poor and only you are, you're killing it. Like, yeah. you want everyone to kill it. Exactly. I've just never, my mom said, even since I was little, that's just never really been an issue for me. It's really easy for me to, like, celebrate others and support other people. I, and I think it's really crucial. I, I, I actually, 99% of the time prior to that experience, I thought I was, but it was something that, um, I wanted not that he got anything that I didn't get. It was just more, he was doing very well and I wasn't doing as well as I thought. Yeah. And that was so, it was such a game changing conversation because as you said, it's right. Who cares if you're on the yacht and you don't, you want to be in an environment. It's, I'm not saying, you know, there's some people that are like, if your friends aren't rich and they aren't doing what you want to do, cut them out. No, I think that's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. When it's like, a, a bus has a hundred seats. Porsches have two. You don't need <laughs> friends, just the car. Yeah, yeah I, I'm not. I'm not yeah. hustle culture. <laughs> no, I, I, we're very much on the same page. But I think it's such a beautiful mindset because something happens at some level that when your environment is doing well, you feel good, even if you don't have the the money, the cars, the house. It is just it's nice to be around, even just at that simple level. Well, that's why it was so hard because this person uh, had the things. It's just like, it was, it was, yeah, it sucked. But I mean, now, because I've made it seem like I'm always at, like, I definitely struggle at times, but it's mostly Instagram related. Go on. I think Instagram fucks me out. Oh, well, it's, it's just like when people everyone. are like selling out, I'm selling out. I was sold out to, and it's like, that's just always been my struggle. Like selling tickets is my nightmare yeah. and it's getting better and better. I've been doing this since 2009. Um, mm -hmm. And people that I look up to when I've opened for them, it was also not huge crowds, but I have had trouble this year. Cause I was like, fuck all my peers are selling out or theaters. And then all these younger people, but then I, I go and perform and I'm like, this is the best. Like, so many people are here. I'm having the time of my life. And so it's like not even real life. Like I'm more influenced by like Instagram flyers than the reality of my life, which is like fantastic. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. You're focusing on when you're in the actual moment, you're focusing on what you have and what you don't have. Whereas Instagram, you know, you know, actors talk about it all the time. I've had so many well, well accomplished actors and they'll have this, they'll be the star of a show. And then they're not doing that show. Then they'll see their friends got a movie. Like, oh, why well, don't I have that movie? But then when they sit back and go, oh, you know what? I was just on the show for five years. Like, it's just, because it's something that we want. So if it's something that we want, that can be an insecurity. And that's completely fine. Because we all have dreams, goals, and aspirations. And want to do the best that we can. Then when we see it a thousand times on Instagram. And it's a reminder to ourselves. But as you said, it's not real. It's a small minority of people that are selling out the theaters and maybe they're not even selling out the theaters. Maybe they've just got a, they've just booked the show, but I really like your mindset of when you're actually in the moment, you're like, you get to do stand up comedy and perform to still a lot of people. Yeah. And it's really fun. And it's what I want it. It's kind of the thing of like, think about what you wanted 10 years ago. Ooh. And then it's like, you're doing it. But, um, yeah, it's just a. It's like, I'm sure it's the this way for other people in other, like careers and life paths. But it is really strong in the entertainment business, yes, because you don't have full control, and it is. It could be fleeting. It could be for you know. It is. It is really preys upon, I guess, instability and insecurity. Instability. That's interesting. I think um, I heard you on another podcast. You talked about, I don't know which comedian it was, but gave you really good advice in that you should enjoy the highs and the lows because it's not always going to be upwards. Do you remember? I just can't remember. I don't, but I remember. Yeah. It's like the ride is it. I don't know who told me that, but I, I definitely believe it. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? Cause especially entertainment. And I know that you do like also acting and stand up where you, one day you can be the biggest name in the world. And then for a few years, still like decent, but you just didn't have the heights of what you thought it should be. And I know that you've won like a lot of up and coming awards. And then when you mm -hmm. lose that title up and coming, you don't get those, you know, it's always been an interesting 
view or mindset with a lot of guests where they're getting all these awards as up and comers. They're then so much better as a stand up, but they don't have the up and coming label. So they might not get as much, you know, news on them. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> definitely the thing. But I liked the award show. Like, I had my variety um, 10 comics to watch award right here. Like, I love yeah. it. It was like a fun day. Um, no, I still like seeing all the lists of who gets them every year. Like, if I have friends and stuff. Oh, I'm into, I don't know. I don't know if I mind not being up and coming anymore. I just feel bad that their predictions are taking longer than they wanted. <laughs> Oh, you're, very, I don't mind. you're very humble. And um, this also sprang to mind. Um, I always find it so unique that when stand-ups get to the level that you're at and, you know, to get to the level that one's at a high level, sorry, you need to have figured out your voice or at least be on the path to figuring out your voice. And that would be a lot of trial and error. Do you feel that you've mastered your voice at this stage? Well, it can always change because you're growing, but I've always, um, that's like honestly a compliment I've gotten since I started and with all my open mic friends and like people that I'm still friends with, I've always been able to be myself on stage. Like, I, I don't know if it's like a cocky thing to say or not, but like, I think I'm meant to do stand up. It's like what I am good at and I love doing it. And it's like the perfect thing for me. And so I just, because what happens, I think a lot is, people are fans of stand up and then you watch tons of stand up. So then when you start, you have an idea of what it is yeah. or what it should be. That wasn't my experience. I didn't even think it was a thing. Like I watched Kings of comedy and Ellen DeGeneres HBO specials, but I didn't connect it to something you can do. And so when I went to my first open mic with someone, it was to watch them. Like I didn't, I didn't know. And then I was watching people and that's when I went up. And so I didn't have, and then I just started writing jokes and going up. And then through time, like I knew who I knew everyone else looked up to. So then I started watching other comedy. Well, I always loved to tell too. Like I saw him live in college and stuff. David tells like my favorite, but, and I think I probably am most influenced by him, but mm. then I started watching everyone. So then you watch the Louis, the Bill Burr, the Patrice, and then you realize everyone's copying them. So I met all these people at open mics being like, oh, cool. And then I noticed everyone else is watching comedy. So then I started watching who everyone liked and then realized, oh, you're all like doing a Mulaney or whatever. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, So I think I got lucky in terms of like, I didn't really have any idols or ideas or like, when I started, I didn't know how, what, it, oh, then you do an hour, then a spec, like, I didn't, uh, that was so far from, I just liked doing it. And that was it. Well, it sounds like you came in with a blank canvas, whereas if yeah. we listen to a thousand different songs, we think music has to be a certain way. Whereas you got up like canvas and then you learned along the way of what you think's funny and not funny. So I think that's actually a really interesting way. You didn't have the comedy. This is the comedy rules. This is how whoever does it and i think that's really interesting because then it allows you to be more you 100 percent. and then sometimes i'm um talking about like envious of people that are like i oh this topic i can write jokes on it i'm gonna sit down at the cafe and write jokes for tonight like i don't do that yeah. and so my process is sometimes a little slower because i'm just go with the flow and when things come to me and sometimes i wish i had a little more discipline in terms of like writing bits at the cafe or whatnot but there's like a group of dudes that i know all successful all doing great but always it was like even to this day when i read their interviews it's always like well comics do this and if you don't write that then you're not a comic and it's like oh how convenient that everything it takes to be a comedian is what you do interesting <laughs> like how 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 cool is that um and so they just annoy me because it's they're always like, well, you're not a com oh, this isn't comedy. Or I'm obsessed with Jessica Kerrison. Um, I watch all of her YouTube shorts before bed. Like she just cracks me up. Her uh, Instagram, I, I love it, and it's all crowd work stuff. And oh, nice. someone, I was talking about her with someone how I'm obsessed, and they were like, well, some people don't think it's like real. And I was like, who would? F what are you talking about? And they're like, well, it's crowd work. And I'm like. It's a show. I don't know. Uh, I, <laughs> so people have these like ideas and I'm free from that. But also I'm very dedicated to the audience. Like I'm not 
oh, it's not about just working out jokes and my hour and what I have to do and being precious about my shit. Like I learned this really early on, but like people are paying for babysitters. They're like paying for parking. They're paying the tickets, the two drink minimums. Like you don't know, people drive state lines sometimes to come to shows. So I like to make sure I'm giving everyone a great show, even if it's not what I had in mind or the set that I wanted to work on or, oh, I'm doing these old jokes. But like, if I know you're going to like them, I might do it. I, I, I want people to have a good time. And that's important to me. I think that's so awesome because when someone's been doing it as long as you and had a lot of, you know, the successes as well, we can let the ego spiral and be, and just, you know, not even think about the audience, but I think it's really important and really empowering when you hear someone like yourself talk about that as well. Just even think about yeah. a babysitter as well. That's really awesome. Yeah. I'm like an entertainer. You know, it's not just about standing doing bits. It's like about a show that people are spending a lot of money for a night out. Yeah. Even if you're not a big name, it's not like a cheap night out. Agreed. And then what's the balance? I've always found this very interesting that you know, as a, in Australia, I know it's different to America where every year it's churning out new material because, the, you know, we do the comedy festival every year and that's our big thing. And I know in America, I think like you don't quite work like that. And that's, that's great. There's, there's differences, but in terms of new material, when you know that what's the balance of doing new material, when you know, you've got a lot of people coming in or you want to still give them the show and still work on newer jokes well, you still want to be funny and you know that you've got the material that's going to work. You could do it all. I think you could do it all. But I actually have some jokes I've been doing forever and I wanted to do an hour special and I'm just hoping I can get an hour together. I think the pandemic really fucked my journey in that. So I'm struggling right now because you still have to like focus on what that hour would look like. So you have to still work on that. But I'm like sick. I'm just like, I cannot wait for them to be out of my life. You mean but the, I, the Yes. <laughs> on, Once I man. record something, it's out of my life. Oh, interesting. So any, yeah. But why? It's like the project's done. I'm done. Except there's a couple one-liners that I still like will throw in that make me happy. Like I like some of my old jokes. So like sometimes I'll just do it because it makes me happy. Like I like my jokes. So that's a thing. But no, once it's like in its final form and Instagram and TikTok actually really fucked with that because now everyone has to put clips and I'm hiring someone to do clips and it's all about clips. And that is annoying to me because they're still like, I don't know, because people see them, but you still want to do them. And that balance has been hard uh, to figure out. Because there, there are some comedians, especially maybe the lesser known ones, where you see an amazing clip or you see like three amazing clips and it's like 10 minutes each or five minutes each. It doesn't matter. And then you actually see the show. And if it's under an hour, you've already seen like a quarter or a half of their material. And there's that balance of, Oh, I've already seen that. Is that what you're talking about? Well, yeah. And what's tough is like the stuff that's going on Instagram is still stuff that I'm like actively working on and would be in this hour show that I want to like record. I want a fucking Netflix special, you know? Yeah. Um, and so it is hard. And, and I hire a dude, so I don't tell him what to do. So like today he posted a joke that's like been my closer. And I'm like, what are you doing? I'm so annoyed. <laughs> stick to the crowd work but it, it it's it's real i hate the clips i hate this part of what's going on but then then i did a show where i was like i'm not going to do any of this stuff i'm going to try to do new stuff crowd work let's build and then after the show these girls were like oh my god you didn't do the jokes we wanted to hear oh. i wanted to hear those jokes from your instagram and i was like fuck and then just in denver someone's like wow i guess you did a lot of the old jokes and it's like you can't right. you know everyone everyone has these like little opinions. So you have to think of the greater good. And um, I've Sounds been like so focused box. on new and new and trying to not to do the old, but I still want to record that hour. And, but then um, someone told me like, I hope I like your jokes, just your jokes. And then the past few weekends I've gone on the road. I just like have been doing my full hour and it feels great. And I'm like, Oh yeah, I love, I have great jokes. Let's do this, That's but awesome. it's time to retire a lot of them. I, I bet some people are talking shit at times of like, wow, that's an old bit. As in comedian friends. Or... Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm so... sure. I mean, cause when I see someone doing an old ass joke, I'm always like, Oh God, are you still fucking doing that? <laughs> So that's why I know you're very good at crowd work. That's why crowd work clips, you know, 
I'd love to know like the ratio. I'm sure it's not always a hit because you, that's why I like those clips because you're not necessarily showing your stand up, but you're still showing your style and how you speak. And people are, hopefully people understand that the crowd works going to be different because you're not always going to get the same person that you speak to. So it still shows your comedy. It's still mm-hmm. different. And then people can't expect that necessarily, but they still get a taste or a flavor of you as a stand up. Yeah. Yeah. But that, and then it's like, you don't want, but then he was started cutting clips where it's like, I start a joke, but then I go into crowd work and then the joke doesn't finish. Uh, and I'm like, it's an unsatisfying thing for yeah. someone. You can't do that. And so then today he posted my closer. Can you give, <laughs> I could see that you should. Can you not just uh, tell this guy that? This well, I will. I'm going to, yes. No, we do, but I don't want to watch it. I'm, I'm about as little work as possible. I know lots of people who make their own clips and pick the clips and cut the clips. I, mean, I have no interest in that. Why is that? Because I also hate clipping the podcast. I just want to do this. I love this. And I don't like the admin and the editing side, but I love this. But I don't, yeah. Yeah, because it's work. I mean, people that do editing for a living are weirdos. <laughs> Should we clip this and send this to your editor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And our podcast editors, it's just, it's a hard, I don't know how people do it. Cause even when I research or you write or something, you can have like noise in the background or TV show something, but editing, you have to be editing. It's like so full focus. I think it, it's so hard to do. I don't know how people do it. Yeah, I agree. And in terms of this new special, is this something on the works? Because it sounds like you've been brewing with it for a while. No, I I wanted to, this material has been cooked. It's cooked, baby. Um, But I'm still, I'm taking this time as like a privilege. So I'm like still fucking with stuff for the order where it's going to go. And it's not in an order. I'm just taping jokes and it's like new stuff's in constantly. Like in Denver, I probably did an hour 10. Like I oh. just... I don't know. Things happen like when and how they're supposed to when you're the most ready. So I kind of like try not to focus on it, but I'm so done with some of these jokes. Can you tell me more about that philosophy? I love it. That it's when it will happen or kind of happen mentality. Yeah. I just feel like I want to do this forever. So I'm not in a rush. Like I don't have a rush. Like I'm not here being like, I have a new hour every year and I have four hours. Like, I don't like, I don't, I don't know. Is this math? Like, um, <laughs> I, I want to work forever. So I don't really have any time goals because I just don't want it to stop, but I want, I will. And I, I just, yeah. <laughs> and Like so many, so often, like people want the thing before they have the thing. Yeah. So for example, I had someone message me, um, they wanted to send a tape in for a Comedy Central half hour. And it said, don't do any material you've already done on television. And so this person was asking me, I did this joke on this other taping, but I changed the end or the tag. Do you think I can still submit it for this half hour? And it's like, Babe, if you don't have a half hour without that joke, you probably shouldn't have a half hour on television. Oh, interesting. You know what I mean? Like, why are you trying to shoehorn this joke they've already seen that you've already taped into an audition for the half hour? Like, you you shouldn't do it. Or I know younger comedians even now, like, get upset about not going to Montreal for new faces or something. And it's like, you're not good. (laughs) Like, do you want to bomb at Montreal? Because people bombed my year, and it was really sad. So it's like... You know, I think you just always want to be overly ready. And of course we think we're ready and we want the things and we want it when we want it. And it's like, it'll happen when hopefully you're the most ready. It's always better to do it too late than too early. It's a very unique mindset. And as you said, a lot better than me, we want it. We want everything like that. But your philosophy is I'm, I'm good at this. I'm going to do this until I die. Or this is the thing that I love. So what's the rush? I'm still going to put in the work, but I'm not going to force it. Because when we force Correct. it. Correct. Yeah. Through my experience, when we force something, it always is bad. You can still want things yeah. to happen, but forcing it is just pushing a boulder up a, up a cliff. Yeah. I just, um, there's like a rush to have it all, but it's like, I, I don't know. I know that when I get certain things that I've wanted, it's going to mean a lot. Like it'll be really, ex- like I'll be really <laughs> enjoying every moment. Um, but I don't know if I have like safety in my life and that's why I feel that way. Or if you I don't know. I, I would have, have no thought idea. that if you had the safety in your life, then 
you would feel less pressure. So you'd be doing what you're doing, but because in your words, you feel like you don't have the, the safety. That's when you force, you're doing it the other way around, which is really interesting. Yeah. Um, I definitely want to retire some bits, but it'll ha- like, I just think about John Hamm, Brian Cranston, you know, like not comedy, but they were both on watch what happens live. <laughs> That's why I'm, re- I'm Bravo. That's why I'm like, they're in my brain, yep. but you know, John Hamm didn't get mad men till his forties. Brian Cranston wasn't in breaking bad till his forties. You know, the whole thing of like Vera Wang didn't create her first dress till her forties. Wow. It's like, I, I don't know. And I think people that get it too young end up being um, kind of assholes. Yeah. It's really interesting. You know, the theme of this podcast is failure as well. And, there's every single person has a unique story, but this springs to mind. I don't know if you watch whose line is it anyway, but Colin Mockery got it. I think he was rejected twice and he got it in his forties and, you know, people see him as like the top improviser. We've had so many examples. I think like Wendy McClendon Covey, who's oh, obsessed. Yeah. I love her. I think she only started in like her thirties or forties, like late thirties. Someone will correct me. And, it's such a unique thing where we think that, you know, you become super famous at 18 or your early twenties, but you know, you're all about longevity and that, you know, you might be able to get quick, short success, but is that going to actually fill you up for the long term? And it's a rare, you know, you're talking about the Instagram kind of like culture. It doesn't really talk about the longevity and that's what you're all about, which I think is so important, regardless if it's comedy, just such a good thing to think about in life. Yeah, and um, it's it, it's stupid, and I don't um, recommend this to anyone. <laughs> but I care about having respect for my peers; like that matters to me. Um, and I, yeah, dumb. Care about money? Go get rich, everyone. <laughs> but <laughs> what? Um, I like being respected by the people. Oh, by, pe- gotcha. by, by my peers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, in Edinburgh, but. But it, it's just different. So in Edinburgh, I did the month. I was in the uh, underbelly. I was in a trailer in the middle of like the college campus. I mostly performed for half empty, sometimes really small. Weekends was more filled. That's but good. what, what I was, it, it, I had so much fun. But what I was really prideful of was every comic, almost every comic I know came to my show and some multiple times. And then other like, and then comics told all their comics to come. So like oh, wow. at almost every gig, I had comics coming all, all the time back again and giving me such nice compliments. And so, of course, it would have been nice to sell out, make a profit, maybe get some more stars or whatnot. Um, and so I don't know if I like <laughs> if I'm like falling on that because I don't have these other things or whatnot. But, but you do. that 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 was that felt good. I'll say that I felt good. Well, I think it's it's a really interesting balance because if you can make other comedians laugh and they can appreciate your craft, they know they'd understand the ins and outs of the business. And it's kind of like the base. If you've got that, then you'll be able to make other people laugh and figure out your audience. Whereas a lot of people oh, can yeah. bypass that and just go for like the quick laugh or, but I think it's so cool that that's a focus of yours as well. It felt good. And I have, I have a lot of enemies. I'm like a combative person, I would say. And I've gotten into a lot of arguments with a lot of comics and like even the dudes that I hate the most and they know it, like at the end of the day, they can't say shit to me because <laughs> <laughs> they know what's up. Like I've recently had an, uh, an interact, like uh, a tiff, whatever. I, we squashed our beef. We had a beef, but um, even when we weren't speaking, my friend was in the back of the room and she's like, he was watching your whole set. He was, and I was like, yeah, of course. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, so it feels I, good, but, um, so I do, I, you know, I it makes me feel proud. That's awesome. And in terms of, oh, I like that you can squash the beef because it's, you know, you, a lot of people can have, that's why I love your podcast. Anyway, we've spoken about, it. I think it's well, so cool. 
I was young too. It's like, I started at 21 years old, like before therapy and all that, you don't know how to regulate emotions all the time. Or I have the, my mom has this too, like she's always fighting at work. I remember as a kid, but like this like sense and need for justice in whatever way. And I don't know how to mind my own business. And I feel like I have to be involved with everyone, call everyone out. If I'm fake that to me, like being fake or phony is like, was the worst thing I can imagine. And so I'm definitely a different person. It would be wild if at 35, I was acting how I was at 25. Yeah. But yeah, I would fight with people. I would try to make big points. And it's it's something I care about. But now I just wrote a joke kind of about it instead. But I don't want to confront every creep and every abuse. Like, I don't have to say something to everybody. But I spent a lot of years getting into messes that really had nothing to do with me. And I should have been maybe focusing more on just craft or business or something but interesting i was like arguing a lot and how have you found that your mental well-being is now since not getting into all of those conflicts mental well-being is still rough like i don't know (laughs) my place is a mess i'm just like looking at my my piles that's what i always tell podcasts here i'll show you a pile it's like It's a mess. Oh, that's not too bad. (laughs) It's bad. So that's what stresses me out. So it's like my mental wellness. I don't know if arguing or I don't know. I have no idea in terms of that. The mental, (laughs) it's the same. My room is always a mess. The room is is one thing, but I would feel that, (laughs) you know, you've obviously evolved and grown, not just from comedy, but as a person since you're in your early 20s and even feeling the need not to, you know, argue and, you know, start conflict just would show that you're more, I'm not sure what the word is, but not more comfortable in yourself because it sounds like you've always been more comfortable in yourself, but you don't feel the need to, you know, that's their own problem. I just can't. And nobody cares. At the end of the day, the amount of creeps that are running around abusing, like not to go here, but like no one cares. Like no one cares if someone's a misogynist. No one cares if someone starts fights with women and is abusing. Like they don't care. As in the guy doesn't care, people care. No, industry, no one cares. Is, Clubs don't care, networks don't, nobody cares. That's very interesting. I thought it was getting better. No, no one cares. There's one guy that I have taught. I ever, I, I will bring it up any moment and be like, he's a piece of shit. No one cares. That, These guys don't care. They don't care. So a, 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 a part of me eventually was just like, I just, why, I'm going to stop. I don't, I don't want to care either. Like I'm done. I'm tired. So in terms of when you deal with that person, do you have, do you have. They know not to talk to me. Well, this is like my favorite. Cause my friend um, actually one time choked this comic out against a wall, <laughs> like at a bar, like bottles knocked around. Like he Holy. truly like, he might've pissed himself even. So I was sitting with the friend who choked this other person out and I don't speak to that other person, whatever. So then my friend was like, wait, why is he more scared of you than me? And I've physically like hurt him. And I was like, because I know who the fuck he really is. And that's more scary. Oh, wow. So you can see through them and then they know to back off. I know what he did. I know. I like, I have... These dudes are have done dirty ass shit and um yeah. Wow. So but it was it was funny. So yeah, people that um they just we I just don't acknowledge people and they don't say hi to me, I don't say hi to them. I've gotten a little more mature and I could say hi actually. Like I'm fine with that, but we just don't communicate and it's okay. Yeah, cuz you don't want to have people like that in your environment but they're still in your workplace so that's always a hard and i don't have the answer for this of what to do especially when you feel there's not and they're delusional there's one comic he was like i wonder if handmaid's tale was real if i'd be a good guy or not and right away i was like nah (laughs) (laughs) he was shocked he's like what do you mean but like he was like so taken aback and i was like babe you still defend like chris (laughs) d'elia like you think you're you're gonna risk your life at during end times to save women for equality? Like I see your Instagram. Like I don't know. You married a woman half your age. Like you're not gonna fight for the women's rights. 
Um, but they just don't see it. But I just, I try not to let things affect me so much. I want to be more calm. I want to be more personable and like not as affected for sure. Uh, what do you mean by not as effective? Not as affected by like. Oh, affected. The things uh, that, yeah. So that shows in my mind and that you've come a long way in terms of being able to deal with some of the absolute fucked up stuff that no one should have to deal with. Yeah, but, you know, a lot of times people will tell me, like, oh, you always say it how it is or what you feel. You always speak your mind. And, like, people kind of like that about me. But I'm like, there are consequences. Yeah. <laughs> like, there are consequences to it. And I don't know if my behavior sometimes has affected things, but well, it sounds I'm like okay with the, it. Well, it sounds like you're on the journey to figuring out what works for you while also yeah. setting strong boundaries so that you don't have to deal with some of those people. But people also bring shit up to me. It's like, what my material angers dudes. Like, it's a oh, thing. Really? I've seen a lot of your I, I have, like, one joke about, like, men not making women come. And it was, like, in my degenerate special. And it's just, like, a 10-minute bit. And my goal was to do something like Patrice did in his Elephant in the Room special, where it's, like, you trap your audience into saying something that they don't want to say with the questions you ask. And then you spin it. Yeah. To like prove a point. And so that was my goal. I wanted to do what Patrice did, but two men. And instead of the woman joke, or it's like, if you know, do you know the joke I'm talking about? No. Um, he asks like ladies, if you didn't have like a pussy, what would you, or like, what do you have to offer men? And every, all the women were like mouth, butt, and he's like, so you, keep saying you're more than f- sex, but I asked what you can offer a man and all you yelled were other holes. And it was just like, it's this incredible moment. And that's like the best comedy is just like when you don't agree, you hate it, but like you just laugh because it's so good and smart and funny. Okay. But, yeah. and so that was my goal with men. So like I would ask the audience, like when a male friend tells you they fucked someone new, what do you ask them? And, you know, the men say all the questions. And I say, well, do you ever ask if he came? And then people laugh. And then the whole point is just, like, the fact that them coming is such a given. They don't even have to ask. But, like, then women have to, like, the, the first question we ask if someone fucked someone is, did you come? And then the, I haven't done this joke in years. So I don't know how it devolves. But it is really funny. And uh, I've see. gotten messages from people saying that um, they make dates watch it. And if their dates don't laugh or they get mad, they don't fuck their dates. <laughs> Um, I've also gone back to cities or like people message me that they ended up breaking up with their boyfriends after coming to see my comedy because their boyfriends were getting so mad at my material. Um, even though it's just a joke, why it's just yeah, a joke. Why can't you guys take it? I, I thought censorship sucks, but, but, um, women tell me all the time they like have to break up or it causes really big problems in their house because they come to see my shows. Well, you know, okay, I never understood why, even if you wrote a horrific joke, which obviously that's not that's funny, why people will go and attack you. Like it's a, it's a joke. It blows my mind. I'm sure you have to deal that with that a lot. But well, it's just- no. If you watch the special, all the women are laughing, and the men, all their arms are crossed in front, and they're like pissed. But I know it's funny. Well, I don't know because the whole point is like. I feel like a lot of men are like, oh, people are too sensitive these days. Like we should be able to say whatever we want. But when it's about them, it's like they can't, they can't actually handle it. And I think who actually can handle it are minorities and women and stuff because they're used to being the butt of the joke. And so when you're actually talking about sensitivity, it's like these dudes who can't handle any of it. It's interesting. I would imagine with that particular joke and, you know, I'm not in the ins and outs of um, like joke making, but that would hit a deep nerve. And so even if it hit a nerve to then react, like, come on, <laughs> if you need to do better than that, because if, if a joke has hit you that hard and you're that upset by it, it means we need to do work on ourselves typically. And so that's where I go. So if I, yeah. I know not yeah, no, you're like great. That. And I wish I remembered my punchline and how the joke went. I truly do not remember, but it's this like long 10 minute joke about cum and like men not making women cum or not caring <laughs> about it. And uh, it's like my final bit. And it meant a lot to me for the years I did it. And I loved the audience interaction. I love what I got from it. Like, cause it, I love that it's 
audience interaction and crowd work, but leads to this big joke. It was just so fun. So my variety top 10 at JFL, I get this award. I felt so cool. I was doing all these shows and I do the variety show. And this guy comes up to me at this party and I'm meeting some cool, and he just starts like, well, my wife wants to use a vibrate and starts like arguing with me. And I fight, I, I go, okay, this wasn't about you. It's not a joke, but also if we're going to go there, then I went in and he's like, how dare you talk about my wife starts flipping out. It's this like oh. weird thing. And I'm just like, this is a work event. This is an industry party. He is the, like one of the top um, comedy producers in the world. Like if you go on his IMDb, he has made like all of the most popular comedy shows in the past decade. And it was like, fuck off. <laughs> I had to audition for him once yeah. after that fight. Wow. Did you... but I was just a comic. Like, did you do that to other people? Like, I don't under, I, it, it's frustrating. So a lot of times, like a lot of the like things I get into are people ba- or, or like one time this really beloved comedian and I love him, whatever. We're sitting in a green room. He's like, all you feminists, you care, you say you care about women, but then, you know, what about all the Instagram models and cool models and this and that? And I go, I pay for porn. I love models. I buy their, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and he was like, oh, well, I don't mean, and I'm like, yeah, like, it's a Saturday night at a comedy festival We're in a green room all drinking and smoking. Like, why do you find the need to try to start a feminist argument with me? Also, whenever anyone starts a conversation with all you, and yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not going to be, oh my God. And with the, um, with the producer and of the guys, if someone goes up to you out of their way. It I'll means... chat it to you in the chat so you know who it is. Okay, so you can I'm not look it say up later. Name. You might not know his but, by name, but if you IMDb'd him, you'd be like, oh my God. It, to me, what you've done is you've hit, uh, I don't know who that is. Um, I will look up now, but um, no, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, I'll give you, I'll, you keep talking. I'm going to look up the IMDB and I'll post it in the chat too. So you <laughs> okay. can see everything this person has made and what production company they own. And you're going to be like, Oh, <laughs> with, with that stuff, it, you know, going back to what I said, it's just, you've hit. And I think it's important. This, this is for me. If I have an adverse, I'm going to have a look. I'm just going to mm-hmm. pause. Just make noises every show that you see. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It's done a lot. Oh, wow. (laughs) Um, To me. And it's like you're like a leader in comedic television. You can't take it. And that joke made you that mad that you found me at a party on like this big moment in my life at this like festival. That means a lot to me. It, it 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 was just like, but I didn't know who he was. And I also don't like, that's another thing. Like, I don't like the idea of like, you would treat someone different if they were um, him or not. Like, I try to treat everyone the same. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think for me, when I hear something that I don't like and I react and I have a reaction where I cross my arms, it means there's something within me that I need to work on. And I think that's a really powerful indicator Unfortunately, there are people that go the other way and say, no, you have to fix it, which makes no sense. We all have to work on ourselves. Even if the joke is terrible, it's, it's about ourselves. So p- people need to just relax and chill. Before we go. Um, oh, we're going to go. I talked too much. No, Sorry I about that. It. I really just went on and on. <laughs> no, no, no. I, th- I really wanted to do this. I just want to tie up <laughs> two points if we have the time. Um, of course. When we were talking about finding your voice, I found this a really interesting lesson that you've learned um, amongst the many that I think you hopefully you remember this. You had a manager or someone was going to be on to watch you and you had this set that you really wanted to do, but you thought you wanted to, you thought you'd please the manager and do a different set and you went against what you thought and the set didn't go to plan. Do you remember that story? I do. Yeah. I'd love to know what your kind of takeaways were from that. Cause I think it's really awesome. Um, but I've, I've also made this mistake in um, like a certain taping I've like made this mistake and I might still make it in the future. Did it at the browsers thing, but like when you're not yourself and you're not comfortable and you're not being you and like following your gut and trusting yourself, like it's never going to be as good as if you're just like in the moment as yourself. Agreed. 
always like and that's why like parameters are hard that's why like forcing or like we need a tape or we need it to be clean or we need this to be like this and it's like i don't i'd rather take my time and wait i don't i don't love parameters or like abandoning who i am you know it's rare because you know a lot of the time we feel we need to please other people because we think that's what's going to work out but when we go against ourselves it doesn't normally work out or at least in my experience yeah, or not being in the moment or second guessing or questioning, like all of that is is always going to end up not not being good. And that's not an all or nothing. It's not like you learn that lesson, like most things in life, and then you just don't do it. It's not like I'll never be combative at, to someone again or like never fuck up and like do something that I felt like I needed to do versus, you know, like you'll always, it's like human, I think, to I make agree. those types of mistakes. Got- We've got the awareness so that we can try and do better each time, which I think is really important. And yeah. the, one of the, another thing which was tied around worth and it's on the similar train to this in that um, you booked one of your favorite clubs and I think you were doing like seven to 10 shows a week, but at this club, you're only doing once a week. And you said that really impacted you. I'd love to know a bit more about that and what you learned from that experience. Yeah. So one of my favorite places to perform, I was like a darling there. I was like just going up all the time, always there. And then I got in trouble and we won't get into all of that, but you know, they just said, you're going to get less spots. So I went down to, like you said, one a week and I was devastated because I put my worth into that place and like all of my value is like connected to being there. And then, so of course it was like a big hit. And then you, then you're like, what am I going to quit? No. So then it was like a nice lesson to like, I can perform anywhere. I could do whatever, like a place doesn't define me or like have full control over my values. So then I became chill about it. Cause that place too, it's like, or anywhere you want to be like sending a veils used to be like stressful and you would wait and be like, I hope I get my spots or am I going to get this or that? And then as soon as you kind of take power away from the place, it's like, okay, if I get a spot, nice, if not, whatever, and then now I get, you know, spots again is when I'm in town and it's fine. <laughs> but like, um, I had to learn that if I'm there or not, it doesn't matter. Oh, that's awesome. Even though I love it and I like being there and I would be sad not to be there, honestly, but like, it doesn't actually affect who I am or like my value as a comedian or a person. Cool. So what we're going to do to wrap up the podcast is to do a very quick rapid fire segment. Well, I have a question. Yes. Wait, so there's 200 episodes. You've obviously been doing this a long time. Are there ever people that come on and you're just like, I disagree with everything they're saying or like this person's a maniac or like, I'm not into this. And do you pretend or do you fight back a little? Like what's the, and has that happened? So those are all very good questions. Because this is more just about yourself and your life, there's not really anything that I can. It's just your life. So I'm just here yeah. to learn about you. And there's going to be mm-hmm. some lessons that I take away and then some that might not resonate with me, if that makes sense. Um, we don't discuss politics or any of that stuff, so which I think is a lot easier to digest. You know, there's yeah. every single person, and I'm not just saying this, has at least one thing that I've left with where I think about a lot. And I... Wow. And I come after the podcast, I do like a a summary of the one key takeaway. And I think that's really awesome for me. Most people have 50, but it's just so awesome. You know, not, you know, we're always going to have different belief systems and stuff. But if, for example, you say something that challenges me, I'm going to think about that and go, you know what, is this a me thing? Or is this not something that really aligns with me? So I don't view it quite like that. I view someone says something I really don't disagree. I really don't like, which doesn't happen. I would come back and say something but that doesn't really happen to the nature of this podcast it's not a combative podcast it's about you know like laughing within someone's journey that's probably the yeah yeah no one's ever like come on and been like i'm totally fine with stealing jokes and i don't get why everyone's mad about it no we i don't (laughs) (laughs) not that i uh we don't i think also to do a podcast like this it takes a special person as well because it is, it is very unique where you have to reveal aspects of yourself and hopefully I do it in a, in a nice way as well, where it's not for everyone. Not every guest wants to talk about the stuff that we've done. 
So there's already like a gatekeeper in that sense that you're coming here to talk about yourself in a, and hopefully in a positive way. Oh yeah. And so they're all different. So we talk so much about comedy, but then sometimes people talk more about childhood or whatnot, right? Like it switches up. Yeah. Uh, we, we did talk about your, your life as well, not just comedy. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like, and, and you know what? I'm already now uh, backtrack because it's like, I have to, now, instead of talking shit and fighting with people, I just talk about how I used to fight with people. And then one day I won't talk about any of that. And that'll be a big, that'll be a big moment in my life. Oh, interesting. No, I think it's really <laughs> um, awesome to hear the journey there and also about being able to set boundaries and then the journey around there. I think that's really empowering because, you know, we all have that within us. So People can gain a lot out of what you've said. Oh, wow. Thanks. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> let me just see. Cause... Now, one more question. Is your background really your home or is that a green screen Zoom background? I'm on holiday. So <gasps> it is real. Wow. And I'm very lucky. <laughs> cool holiday. I know. <laughs> uh, uh, you're very kind. So, so I love a game. I love rapid fire. We, we, we'll do a two minute one. I'll just ask three. So uh, what's been your special ingredient to work all these years? Fun. Special ingredient? Yeah. Yeah, I have a good time. And I think, yeah, good time, fun time. It's fun. What are you most proud of? (laughs) Uh, What am I most proud of? I think being able to perform in like Chicago, New York, and LA and living and kind of doing comedy at a high level in all three like giant cities across this country and like performing at the best clubs in those places. I think that's like what I'm most proud of. I'm not going to comment on them, but that's cool. Next big. Why? Why? No. (laughs) No, Because if I comment, I'll derail them. And I I think that was a great answer. Next big dream. No, I mean. That's awesome. I'm not going to comment because if I go, that's awesome, then I'll just take away from the rapid fire element. I thought you were about to shit on Chicago or something. (laughs) Next big dream or goal? An hour special Netflix. I want, I don't care if it's stupid to want a brand, but I want an hour Netflix special. And I want to move back to New York. Oh. Why? And learn how to have a clean room. <laughs> Why back to New York? I'm just happier there. And you're in LA at the moment? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have to get it together. And maybe um, like, cr- uh, pit, like, cr- um, like write a sh- like fin- uh, finish a project, pitch, make a show. Make a show, sell a movie. Like, um, I want to write, doing like, that? make a thing. I, I'm always like developing stuff, but my process is so slow. No, I saw on IMDb that there's an unentitled movie that you've been working on. Really? Or TV show? That was a long. I had one a while ago, yep. like a long time ago, but that never went anywhere. But I learned a lot. You know, this is all about lessons. Okay. That's what's so funny about this industry, where it's like, um like sometimes people online will insult you and be like, Oh, you've only been in one season of this. And it's like, if, if people only knew (laughs) how long the journey takes to just be in a pilot, you know, like I think, uh, but whatever. Yeah. Uh So Netflix hour, clean my room, live in New York, finish a written project and be in it. And, um, like book more acting stuff or have survival of the thickest get a season two would be huge so can you tell us about survival of the thickest yes um queen michelle buto she's so funny talented dynamic like such a good leader and like she's just awesome to work with and the show is based on her book and so she's working in the fashion industry she catches her boyfriend cheating on her then she moves, she has to move out and she moves in with me and I'm a little bit of a nut, but, um, <laughs> you know, she has her friends and she has, she's like motivated to make it in her career and sh- to find love. And it's just like about her life. And then we're all like fun supporting characters in it. 
It sounds and looks amazing, and I believe it's yeah. out July the 13th, so I hope you get 10 seasons because I know how hard it is. <laughs> um, Hell yeah. Before we go, uh, how can people follow you and keep up to date with you? Um, I'm at Glitter Cheese on Instagram, and then I have a link tree, and so there are all my like stand-up dates or any information or links to whatever or my Netflix half hour or specials. Um, and then I have a podcast called That's Messed Up, an SVU podcast with my friend Kara. And that, again, Instagram or wherever you podcast. All of those will be in the episode notes below so people can check them out. Thank you so much. You are hilarious. Thank you. And really empowering. And I'm very excited to see the next 10 seasons of Survival of the Thickest. Thank you. Bye. I love Lisa's take on being yourself and linking it to success and longevity. Oftentimes, we want to experience quick success and get instant results. Lisa encourages us to take a step back and realize that you'll increase your chance at success and more times than not happiness if you decide to be you. That is embracing the best sides of yourself and honoring that. She says, when you're not yourself, and not comfortable, and you're not being you, and following your gut and trusting yourself, it's never going to be as good as if you're in the moment being yourself. So I'll leave you with this epic quote. Success is not about being better than someone else. It's about being better than you used to be. Wayne Dwyer. Thank you for listening to the Funny and Failure podcast, exploring the deeper side of comedy. (laughs) 